Hello everyone and welcome to a brief introduction to logic. So this should hopefully follow up on and elaborate on the terminology that was introduced in our introduction to philosophy PowerPoint. So this really is a brief introduction in that the material that I'm going to cover um, is something that you could spend a whole quarter on, right? But I want to give us the basic tools that we're going to need to be successful in our class, both in constructing our own arguments and assessing others. So to start us off, right, what we want to talk about again is the way we're using arguments in philosophy. We don't mean the way people argue in regular life, especially, right? We have plenty of examples of that today, but instead we're talking about giving reasons for thinking that something is the case, right? So that's what an argument is for us. And as we know, just because someone gives an argument doesn't mean it's a good argument. So we have to not only make sure that arguments are being given and assessed, but we know how to figure out what are good versus bad arguments. And so this will not just depend on what you're trying to argue for, but rather the reasons that you are giving. So an argument by a more technical definition is a group of statements in which one of them is meant to support the others or be supported by the others. So the statements um, or the, the terms or propositions that are gonna be used in an argument, we're gonna call them statements here in the sense that they should be something that is either true or false. Now, the reason I wanna make that clear is because we could give arguments for all kinds of things that are really more matters of opinion, right? So I can give you an argument for why chocolate is the best flavor ice cream, but those are not really the arguments that we're interested in in philosophy. We want to be arguing things that are, at least in theory, right? determinable to be true or false, right? So for instance, whether or not the earth is flat, right? That's not gonna be a matter of opinion, despite what many people might think. So the statement that you're going to be arguing for, right, or the statement being supported by other statements is called the conclusion. And when we write our arguments, that usually ends up showing up last, but in a paper, the conclusion can show up anywhere, right? So in a, an essay, you might be used to this being called the thesis statement or something like this, right? So it's the thing we are trying to show, the thing we're trying to argue for in this case. And then the statement or statements that are going to be supporting the conclusion are known as premises. Now this is really important. Arguments can only have one conclusion and they must have at least one premise, but they could have as many premises are needed. There's no maximum number of premises um, for arguments, right? But only one conclusion and at least one premise. If there's not one premise, then you're just making a statement, right? So it only counts as a conclusion if it's being supported by at least one premise. Okay, so a little bit of a review here. All right, so again, we don't just wanna be able to identify what an argument is, but also making sure we have good reasons for an argument. Now, this is something that is gonna be a little bit tricky, again, especially in the culture we are living in where apparently people think they can believe whatever they want. But an argument, while it can be useful to persuade someone to agree with you, is not necessarily the same thing as persuasion, right? So to be persuasive, you'll, all, you'll often hear terms like rhetoric being used, right? So I can give you an argument right, for thinking that it is raining outside. But that might be different from persuading you to believe that it's raining outside. Or uh, another example is, um, right, many of you might be familiar with the arguments uh, for or against eating meat, right, for being a vegetarian or being a vegan. Again, knowing what those arguments are and understanding whether they're good or not is different from actually being persuaded to believe them. So when you look online and uh, you're perhaps looking into some of these views, what might be more persuasive to you, say to accept vegetarianism or veganism is not a deductively valid argument, but perhaps a video which appeals to your emotions, right? There's a video I like to show in my environmental ethics class where a bunch of people are being told that they're going to um, get to eat bacon today, right? So they're very excited to eat bacon for free. And then they bring in these little baby piglets, right? So, and of course you can imagine the reactions. Everyone's like, oh no, I can never eat bacon again, right? So there's no argument there, right? But that still nonetheless is a very persuasive tactic, right? So just know that arguments can be used for persuasion, right? But they're not necessarily the same thing. And more importantly, we are often persuaded by things that are not arguments, right? So when we're assessing whether or not we should be convinced of something, we wanna be able to know the difference 
of whether or not someone's giving us a good argument for it or whether or not they're appealing to perhaps some other emotion or tactic just to persuade us to agree with them. All right, so in order to make sure that we are giving good arguments and believing good arguments, we don't just want the premises of our arguments to be true, but we want to make sure that they have a certain structure, right? In this case, we're calling it solid logic, but specifically, we're going to want valid arguments or at least strong inductive arguments. Okay, so first we want to talk about how to distinguish between something that is an argument and something that isn't, and then we'll get into the different types of arguments. So here's an example of an argument. Law enforcement in the city is a complete failure. Incidents of serious crime have doubled. Okay, so the reason that this is an argument first is we want to check is there something that is trying to be proven, right? Something that is trying to assert as true, right? That would be our conclusion. Then if we think we've identified that, we want to see if the other statement or statements actually end up supporting it. So looking at these two, try to figure out which one you think is the conclusion. Is it the first one, law enforcement in the city is a complete failure, or incidents of serious crime have doubled. Since I've already told you it's an argument, I'll let you know that the first statement is intended to be the conclusion, right? Because the second statement is giving us reason to believe the first. The first statement doesn't give us reason to believe the second, okay? But now I'm going to show you an example of something that's very similar, right, but doesn't contain an argument. Law enforcement in the city is a complete failure. Nothing seems to work anymore. We've seen this kind of bad situation before. Now again, just because the first statement is the same, doesn't mean this is an argument because remember, we have to make sure that the other statement or statements are actually working to support it. And in this case, they're not. Um, they're so vague in this case, we don't even know if they're related, but since they're grouped together, we might assume that they are. But these second statements give us no reason to think that law enforcement in the city is a complete failure. So to locate an argument, Again, we want to first find the conclusion and then make sure that the other statement or statements, the premises, are actually working to support it. And uh, based on the reading that you have, you can look for certain indicator words to help you find the premises and the conclusion. So when we're, as I mentioned before, when we're reading arguments, they're not going to be given to us in a very simple form. They're going to be embedded in very complex paragraphs or essays. Uh, sometimes you can find arguments in blogs, in poetry, right? So there's lots of different forms that arguments can come in. So to make sure that we can assess them, we want to draw out the conclusion and the premises, right? The, the parts that are relevant to establishing the conclusion. And then we want to reorder them in what we call formal structure. Right, so this involves numbering each line, right, premise one, premise two, however many premises there are. Then you would include a solid line or a break, and then you would establish the conclusion, right? So it would look something like this, right, however many premises, and then the conclusion. Now, there are going to be lots of examples that we go over, but one of the things that we want to be aware of is that there's a flow going through these arguments. So for example, a very famous one is all men are mortal, Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal. Now, some of you might have already heard that argument, but even if you haven't, you probably could have guessed what the conclusion was going to be. And the reason you can do that is because your brain is already hardwired to look for patterns, right? And this sort of pattern recognition, moving from statement to statement, and moving through them to the conclusion is called inferential reasoning, right? So that's what we want to be doing. If you're going through an argument and let's say, right, Socrates is a man, all men are mortal, therefore Socrates is a cat, right? What? Where did that come from? That should be a red flag, right? So if there's something that appears in the conclusion that appears nowhere in the premises, that's a red flag that something is amiss with that argument, right? So we want to make sure that those those intuitions we have about pattern recognition can be useful to us. All right, so now looking at the types of arguments that we're going to be interested in. So there are overall two main categories of arguments, deductive and inductive arguments. What's interesting about this is that deductive arguments are going to be the, the more structurally sound arguments that we want, right? They're the best kind of arguments you can make. 
But interestingly enough, most of the arguments that we get in life are inductive, and we'll talk about why that is. But to start with deductive arguments, right? By definition, they are intended to give logically conclusive support for their conclusions. So that if the premises are true, the conclusion has to be true. Now notice the words here, intended and if. This is because something could be a deductive argument, but fail to have the right structure, and so not end up guaranteeing the truth of the conclusion, right? So the idea in recognizing a deductive argument is trying to figure out what it's trying to do, right? Is it trying to prove its conclusion beyond a doubt, right? As opposed to what we'll see with inductive arguments, which are more about probability, right, and likelihood. So they're going to ha always have a little wiggle room. But if we're trying to prove a conclusion beyond a shadow of a doubt, that is a deductive argument. So here's an example, premise one, all dogs are mammals. Premise two, Rex is a dog, therefore, right, use that inferential reasoning, therefore Rex is a mammal. So again, right, if we are trying to prove that Rex is a mammal beyond a shadow of a doubt, right, then it's a deductive argument. And in this case, right, we are given reasons that if premise one and premise two were true, then the conclusion would have to be true. So, as I mentioned, right, in order to actually be a successful deductive argument, it has to have the right structure, and when it does, these arguments are called valid, right? Validity, though, is really tricky because, as I mentioned, it's only if the premises are true. Our minds often jump to whether or not the statements are true to determine whether or not it's a good argument, but ironically, that's the last thing we want to do when assessing arguments. It doesn't really matter whether or not the premises are true until the very end. The reason for that is that if it doesn't have the right structure, then it's not going to lead to the conclusion, so it doesn't even matter if they're true, right? So we want to go through the steps of checking that structure first before we worry about whether or not the premises are true in the world, okay? So if a deductive argument does not have the proper structure, and we'll talk about that, then it is said to be invalid. And what that means is that even if the premises were true, it doesn't guarantee the conclusion. Okay, so again, the validity or lack thereof de de deductive arguments is a separate issue from whether or not the premises are actually true in the world, right? So it's a matter of structure, not of truth, right? So it's only if they were true do they guarantee the conclusion. Okay. Now, if we do have a deductively valid argument and it turns out that all the premises are true in the world, that is then what we called a sound argument. Okay, so here's an example of a deductively valid argument that is unsound, right? So we're checking if it's deductive, then we're checking if it's valid, then we're going to check if it's sound. Okay, so here, all men have five arms, Anthony is a man, therefore Anthony has five arms. So this is a deductive argument, right? We're trying to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that Anthony has five arms, right? There's no maybes or somewhats, right? There's no indicators in there of probability. Now we want to see if it's valid. Well, if it were true that all men had five arms, and if it were true that Anthony is a man, then yes, Anthony would have to have five arms. So this is valid. But is it sound? Well, now we're going to go back and check if the premises are actually true, and obviously premise one is false, right? So this is a deductively valid argument, but it is unsound. All right, so now before we go into um, some patterns or argument forms that will help us remember and be able to quickly identify which arguments are valid, I want to introduce a couple of other terms and some helpful hints for us. So the first term that I want to introduce is a conditional statement. Conditional statements are if-then statements. Conditional statements have two parts, the part that comes after the if and the part that comes after the then. The part that comes after the if is called the antecedent. And so this is the thing that has to be true in order for the second part to follow. And the second part that comes after the then is called the consequent, right? It's consequently going to happen if the antecedent occurs. Another statement I want to introduce is a disjunctive statement. These are either or statements. 
and each part of a disjunctive statement is called a disjunct. So the part that comes after the either and the or are both disjuncts. They don't have different names like with a conditional statement. And that's because disjunctive statements, you can usually switch the order, right? And it doesn't have any bearing. It doesn't change the meaning of the statement at all. Whereas you can't swap the first and the second part of conditional statements like that. The ordering is very important as to whether or not the statement makes sense. Negation is also a word that we're going to use a lot, and that's to deny something, right, or to say the opposite of something. And then finally, a lot of the argument forms that we're go going to look at that have um, not just names in English, but they also have Latin names, I want you to remember that if it has a Latin name, that means it is a valid argument form. So when we go over the invalid argument forms, you'll note that none of those have Latin names. All right, so now we're going to start off with some of our first deductively valid argument forms. Okay, so the first one is modus ponens, which is a fancy Latin term, so we know that this is valid. Another trick to help you remember is that with the argument forms that start with modus, those are always going to start with a conditional statement, which we remember is an if-then statement. Now, I'm going to give you some examples, but just so you know, I'm going to be using variables. Um, we could use P, Q. In these examples, I'm using A and B. Just know that these letters are stand-ins, like in math, and we can plug any simple statement into them. But the important thing is that if a variable repeats on multiple lines, the same statement has to occur at every point. So I'll show you what I mean by that. So let's start off with modus ponens again. Latin term, it's going to be valid. Modus starts with a conditional statement. The other nice thing to know is that the English version of the name tells you exactly what's going to happen on premise two. So the English name for modus ponens is affirming the antecedent, which, as we remember, comes after the if. So we're going to affirm it, right? So we're going to say on premise two, A, right? And as you can see in the example, A is it is raining. So we have it is raining in the same place as the variable, right? A on P1 and A on P2. Okay, so if A then B, A, therefore B, right? If it is raining, then I need an umbrella. It is raining, therefore I need an umbrella. The next one is modus tollens. So again, Latin name, it's going to be valid. Modus, it's going to start again with a conditional statement. But the English version of this name, again, is going to tell us what happens on premise two. And the English name for this argument form is denying the consequent. Right? So the consequent is B. So we're going to deny it on premise two. So we're going to say not B. Therefore, not A. Okay? So in other words, if it is raining, then I need an umbrella. I do not need an umbrella. Therefore, it is not raining. All right, the next argument form, disjunctive syllogism. This doesn't have a fancy Latin name, but it is valid. In fact, all uh, not all syllogisms are valid. Syllogism just means a three-lined argument. But this one is um, hopefully pretty easy to remember just because we're starting off with a disjunctive statement. And there's really only a couple things we can do with that. So a disjunctive statement, again, is an either-or statement. So, for example, we can either take the I-5 or Highway 99 to get to Seattle. Now, the important thing with disjunctive syllogism is that on premise two, you have to deny one of the disjuncts. But it, like I mentioned before, it doesn't really matter which one. So we could deny A, and then we would end up with B as our conclusion, or we could deny B and end up with A as our conclusion. So just make sure that on premise two, you're denying one of the options in premise one and then you can wind up with the other, right? So we're given two options, you take one away, so you're only left with the other. So in this case, we're going to deny A, we can't take I-5 because it's closed, therefore B. Again, it could go the other way, either A or B, not B, therefore A. Another syllogism, another three-lined ar argument, but in this case, a hypothetical syllogism. Okay, so in this case, we are looking at hypothetical, which is another word for a conditional statement, right? So if A, then B. And now we're going to give a couple of options here. So if Anthony drinks lead, then he will be really sick. If Anthony gets really sick, then he'll go to the hospital, 
Now this, if any of you are remember from math, a equals b, b equals c, therefore a equals c. It's the same thing here. So in our first conditional statement, the antecedent is a, and in our second conditional statement, the consequent is c. So what's important here is that b occurs in two lines, but it has to be in the opposite spot. So it has to be in the antecedent in one case and the consequent in another. And just like in math, you're like canceling it out and then we're just combining the other two. So our conclusion would be, therefore, if A, then C. So this hypothetical syllogism is just three conditional statements. And just like that math rule, we're cutting out the part that they have in common and then just joining the first antecedent with the second consequent. Okay, the next deductively valid argument form is a little bit trickier, but it's a really useful strategy when you're trying to argue against someone, but you maybe can't directly criticize them. So this argument form, again, fancy Latin phrase, reductio ad absurdum, it just means to reduce to absurdity. So first I'm gonna show you the strategy here, and then we're going to look at an example. Okay, so the first line of any reductio is to actually assume the opposite of what you want to argue for. So let's say I want to argue that ghosts don't exist, right? Well, I might think that that's hard to do, so I might use this strategy. I'm going to assume that ghosts do exist, then I'm going to show that that assumption that ghosts exist somehow leads to something absurd, right? So something like, okay, I'm assuming ghosts exist. If ghosts exist, then, I don't know, everything we know about science and matter is false, right? That seems unacceptable. Therefore, right, or this implies that premise one ought to be rejected, right? Because we can't just reject everything that science has taught us. So it turns out that the opposite of P1 must be true, that in fact ghosts do not exist. So that's just one example. Here's another one. Okay, let us assume that heavier objects fall faster to the center of the earth, right? So again, that's not what we actually want to show, but it's the opposite. Okay, so now we're going to show something absurd follows from this. Okay, if P1 were true, right, if we, then if we dropped two cannonballs of unequal mass from the top of the leaning tower of Pisa, then they will hit the ground at different times, right? Because if it's true that heavier objects fall faster, right, then the heavier cannonball should hit the ground faster. However, we know that that is not true. If any of you are uh, familiar with the very famous experiment, right, that all things fall to the center of the earth at the same time, right, this is how it was supposedly proven, right, and we can prove it here via reductio ad absurdum. Okay, so this is a strategy you might see employed. It's something you might think you want to use, but just so you understand, it does have a valid argument form to it. All right, so just a review of deductive arguments, right? They try to prove or demonstrate their conclusion. They're only valid if the premises are true and the conclusion must also be true, okay? And when they are valid, they are thus truth preserving. Right, that structure guarantees the truth of the conclusion. And then if it turns out we have a deductively valid argument and the premises are actually true in the world, then our argument is sound. Okay, so now let's look at invalid arguments. Now these are going to look dangerously similar to some of our valid arguments. So we wanna be really careful to keep an eye out for these and to make sure that we are not constructing invalid arguments. So if you recall back to our modus ponens and modus tollens, right, they were affirming the antecedent or denying the consequent respectively, these are the opposites of those. So the first one is going to, or sorry, I have a different example here involving Sophie first. So uh, let's start off with a general invalid argument. All right, P1, all Jedi love vegetables, or another case, all A's are B's. Premise two, Sophie loves vegetables. Therefore, Sophie is a Jedi, okay? So this is a deductive argument, right? I'm trying to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that Sophie is a Jedi, but it is invalid because even if it was true that all Jedi love vegetables, and even, and even if it were true that Sophie loves vegetables, which she does, it doesn't guarantee that Sophie is a Jedi. 
right? So this, um, if you're having trouble understanding why, even if the premises were true, the conclusion doesn't follow, you might employ uh, something like Venn diagrams, right? So if we had um, a circle of Jedi, right? All the Jedi, then that whole circle would be maybe inside another circle of larger people who love vegetables. So then when we're told that Sophie loves vegetables, we're not sure necessarily based on this information where to put Sophie, right? Does she go in the larger circle of people who love vegetables or in the smaller circle of Jedi who love vegetables? And because we don't know, right, based on the information that's given to us, we cannot be sure that Sophie is a Jedi, right? She could just be in the larger group of people who loves vegetables that are non-Jedis. And she does love vegetables, like she likes to cuddle with them when we cook, right? So again, there's something wrong with the structure here in that even if the premises were true, the conclusion does not follow, okay? So this is an invalid argument. Now again, right, we don't necessarily need to know that it's true that all Jedi love vegetables. So if that was the first thing your mind went to, remember, that's about soundness. And we don't even get to that point because it turns out this argument is invalid, so it doesn't matter if the premises are true because they wouldn't guarantee the truth of the conclusion anyways. All right, so now we're coming to the invalid argument forms. So again, these are gonna be the opposites of our modus ponens and modus tollens. So here we have denying the antecedent, right? So again, antecedent implies we're dealing with a conditional statement. And again, the name is gonna tell us what's gonna happen on line two. Okay, so if A then B, not A, therefore not B. So we have to be careful, right? This is not a good argument to make. Let's see why with an example. Okay, if Anthony is a father, then he is a man. Anthony is not a father, therefore Anthony is not a man. Now, obviously, because you understand that the truth of this doesn't make sense, right? You're probably able to think that it's invalid, but it's important to understand again that the invalidity is because of the structure of the argument. So the reason that we're not allowed to infer anything when we deny the antecedent is because with conditional statements, we only know what happens if the antecedent is true, right? Then we know that B will follow. So if B doesn't follow, right, then we can infer not A, but we can't infer anything from not A. So another example would be, if I go to the store, then I will buy donuts. I did not go to the store. But does that mean I didn't buy donuts? No, I could have gotten donuts from other places, right? We live in the age now of grocery delivery or someone could have brought me donuts, right? So again, we only know what happens if A is true, right? Then B would follow. And because if A then B, we know if B doesn't occur, then it means A must not have occurred either, okay? So this is something we are not allowed to do. Do not use this argument form and be on the lookout for it. All right, the second invalid argument form that we're gonna look at is affirming the consequent. And again, this is basically following the same rules. We only know what is true if A. Okay, so if A then B, B therefore A, right? This kind of looks like a modus ponens, but it's not. So again, if Anthony is a father, then he is a man. Anthony is a man, therefore Anthony is a father doesn't follow, right? Even if P1 and P2 are true, the conclusion could still be false. Again, another example, if I go to the store, then I will get donuts. I got donuts. That doesn't mean I went to the store. We don't know how I got the donuts, okay? All right, so again, just be on the lookout for these. They're very similar to modus ponens and modus tollens, but they're invalid. All right, um, before we go on to inductive arguments, the other thing I wanna just remind us is that when we're dealing with those disjunctive um, uh, syllogisms, remember that you have to deny one of the disjuncts on premise two. So sometimes people say either A or B, A, therefore not B. That doesn't work, right? Because it could be A and B. So it only works if you're denying one of them. So that's the other sort of invalid argument to look out for. Okay, now moving on to inductive arguments, right? These are different in that they are supposed to give us probable support for our conclusions, right? They're not trying to prove the conclusion beyond a doubt. And 
if their premises are true, it just means that the conclusions are probably true, right? So these, by their very nature, are going to be weaker than deductive arguments, just in the sense that they are not truth-preserving, right? Even if the premises are true, they never guarantee the truth of their conclusion. And this brings us back to an important point I mentioned earlier, which is that most of the arguments that we have in the world that formulate the base of our knowledge are inductive arguments, right? So think about basically everything we know from the medical communities, right? Um, right? We're living in a, the age of a global pandemic. We're very concerned about how effective certain treatments are or um, practices at lowering the likelihood right, of contracting certain illnesses. And so you'll see on disinfectant products that they're 99.99% effective, right? And you might wonder why is it that they can never give us a 100% guarantee? This has to do with the fact that inductive arguments are always making conclusions or making statements in their conclusions that go beyond what is established in the premises. And that's because the premises will always have something to do with the past and the present. But the conclusions will go from observations about the past and the present and make conclusions or predictions about the future, right? And so just because something has been effective in the past doesn't mean it's going to be effective in the future, right? So this is, again, that sort of underlying issue with inductive arguments. Again, we think of maybe like a surgery, right? There's never going to be 100% yes or no about whether or not a surgery is going to be a success, right? It's going to be 80% successful if you're in this group or age range, right? That's because, again, just because we've observed things in the past doesn't mean we can guarantee that they will happen in the future. Now, this goes into a lot of uh, philosophical, philosophically interesting arguments, um, like those by David Hume with the problem of induction, right? Things like we're not sure if the sun is going to rise tomorrow, right? Why is that? Well, because our belief that the sun is going to rise tomorrow is based on inductive reasoning. We think it's going to rise tomorrow. Why? Because it has risen every day in the past, right? And we think that the past will continue to shape the future. Why? Because the past has shaped the future in the past. But again, none of that is a guarantee for what's going to happen tomorrow. All right, so here's an example of an inductive argument. 85% of the students at this university are Republicans. Premise two, Sonia is a student at this university. Therefore, Sonia is a Republican, or probably a Republican. Now, I included probably in the conclusion here because sometimes inductive arguments won't use that indicator word. They'll try to make it seem like their conclusion is you know, being established or guaranteed. But even if it probably wasn't written here, we would still know that this is inductive. Why? Because of the 85%, right? So anytime you see a mention to statistics or you see a qualifying word like somewhat or most, you know, anything like this, those are indicators that we're dealing with inductive arguments, right? Anything that makes us doubt or gives us room to doubt whether or not the conclusion will follow, right? So this is inductive because just because, just based on the premises here, we might think that the conclusion is likely to be true, but it's never going to be guaranteed because Sonia could be part of that other 15%. Okay, so inductive arguments, like deductive arguments, are trying to do something. But just like deductive arguments can go wrong and be invalid, inductive arguments can go wrong as well. So we want to ask ourselves again, if the premises are true, in this case, does it make the conclusion more likely to be true or not? If the premises are true and it means the conclusion is more likely to be true, then we call these arguments strong. Right, so strong arguments, again, if the premises are true, then the conclusions are probably true or more likely to be true. Now, I will tell you that strength is somewhat relative, not in that, you know, it can just mean whatever we want, but then it sort of depends upon the stakes. Now, in typical situations, right, where maybe it's not like a life or death situation, strength would be more than 50% likely to be true, right? So it just has to be more likely than not, okay? So just more than 50%, that would make it strong. But we might think that in certain situations, like perhaps where there is a matter of life and death at stake, 
we might want our bar for strength to be a little bit higher, right? So I mentioned, like, let's say you're going in for a surgery, right? And the survival rate is only 75%. That might feel a little low to you, right? So there might be cases in which we want to raise the bar for strength, but in general, we're just going for more likely to be true than not. Now, if the premises are true and the conclusion is still not very likely to be true, then we would call it a weak argument. So we have similar ideas, but different terms. So for deductive arguments, we had valid and invalid. For inductive arguments, we have strong and weak. All right, so one of the common types of inductive arguments that we come across is something called inference to the best explanation, right? This is a form of reasoning in which we look at a certain state of affairs. We typically rule out, right, through a process of elimination, what is not the best explanation, right? So we're left with something that, okay, given everything I know, this is the best explanation for what I'm observing. And then from that, we assume that because it's the best, that it must be the actual explanation, right? So again, this is very common, right? Again, we use this reasoning all the time. So let's say that Tariq flunked his philosophy course. The best explanation for his failure is that he didn't read the material. Therefore, he didn't read the material. Again, just because something is the best explanation doesn't mean it's the actual explanation. And there's a couple reasons for this. One, as human beings, we are fallible, right? There's only so much that we know. So when we're thinking of all the potential reasons why someone could flunk a philosophy course, maybe we're missing something, right? Maybe there was an option that we didn't even think of. Like maybe Rebecca has a, a weird attendance policy where you have to be there an exact number of days and Tariq missed one day. And so that's why he flunked, right? So we never are fully aware of all the potential explanations, which means that just because something is the best of what we did consider doesn't mean it's true, right? There could have been a, a better explanation that we just didn't know about or didn't consider. Another thing is, again, because we are fallible, right? Just because something is the best doesn't mean it's actually true, right? We might be thinking of best in subjective terms, right? What seems best or makes more sense to me might not make sense to someone else. So just know that inference to the best explanation is always an inductive type of reasoning, right? We're never going to be guaranteed that just because something is the best explanation, it's the right one. Okay, so again, inductive arguments try to make their conclusion more probable or likely. If the premises are true and the conclusion is therefore more probably true, it's strong, right? But again, no matter how strong the inductive argument is, it will never guarantee the truth of the conclusion. So these are not truth preserving the way deductive arguments are. And just like with deductively valid arguments, after we assess their structure, we go out into the world to see if the premises are true. If they are, we call them sound. Similarly with inductive arguments, if we have an inductively strong argument, then we can go out in the world and check if their premises are true, and if it is, then we would call it cogent. So I have a little graph here just to help you keep these terms clear in your mind and also the steps by which we want to analyze or assess an argument. So first, right, we want to make sure that we're actually dealing with an argument and not just an explanation or a series of statements that happen to be, right, loosely related. So once we are for sure that we're dealing with an argument, then we want to know what kind of argument, right? Is it deductive or is it inductive? Okay. If it's deductive, then we want to know, is it successful, right? If it is, if the premises are true and the conclusion is guaranteed, then it's valid, right? If the premises are true and the conclusion could still be false, it's invalid. Similarly with inductive arguments, if the premises are true, and the conclusion could still is still probably false, then it's weak. If the premises are true, and that means the conclusion is probably true, then it's strong. Now notice here on the next line, right, this is where we're checking to see if the premises are true in the world. So it's the very, very last step. And you'll notice that we should only waste our time doing this if we're dealing with a deductively valid argument or an inductively strong argument. Again, because if our deductive argument is invalid, it doesn't matter if the premises are true because they will not lead to the conclusion. If our inductive argument is weak, it doesn't matter if the premises are true because they don't make our conclusion more likely. So 
deductively valid arguments? Does it have true premises? Yes, then we call it sound. No, then it's unsound. Inductively strong arguments, if it has false premises, right, it's uncogent. If the premises are true, then it is cogent. Okay, so again, terms separated and also the steps in identifying and assessing an argument. All right, so you can take a break now, but um, I'm gonna just keep going. So when you're ready, we're going to start looking at how to pull these arguments out from more bulky text and then also get into how to construct our own arguments. So when we're reading any text, but especially philosophy, right, any sort of argumentative piece, we want to approach that text with an open mind, meaning that we haven't already decided that it's rubbish, right? I know we do this a lot. Um, perhaps you've heard of confirmation bias, right? So the idea is that usually from a headline, we already decide if we agree with, you know, the, the thesis or the conclusion of, of a paper, so we decide to read the ones we agree with and we don't read the ones we disagree with, right? So we don't want to do that, right? We want to make sure that we are being open, right? As long as it's from a reliable source, doesn't mean you have to read everything, right? But if we're dealing with a reliable source of information, we should be open to at least listening and understanding the argument. Okay, so this means that we have to read actively, right? And so we have to make sure that we're not just passively reading something, that we're actively engaging with the ideas, right? So reconstructing them. And then again, assessing whether or not the arguments given are any good, right? So that's the critical lens. So again, we want to identify what the conclusion is first and then what the premises are. And then we want to outline, paraphrase, or summarize the argument into those formal structures, right? So you kind of get a sense of, well, what kind of argument are they making here? Maybe I can make that fit into modus ponens, or it seems more like a disjunctive syllogism, right? They're giving me an either or. So this comes, you know, after a bit of practice, but we'll go through some, some examples together. Then after you've put their argument into standard form, that's then when we can evaluate it, right? So is it deductive? Is it inductive? Is it valid? Invalid, strong, weak, all of that stuff. All right, so here's an example. I'm going to give you a chance to read it and then to practice formalizing on, on the next slide. So look at this pa passage here and try to figure out what the conclusion is, what the premises are, and which argument form it would best fit into, okay? So pause if you wanna take a minute to do this. I'm gonna go on to the next slide to show you an example of what you could have come up with. Okay, so, right, first we could do have something like to give up meat is to endanger who we are socially and genetically. Premise two, eating meat is a pleasure. Premise three, our eating meat is good for animals, therefore we should definitely eat meat. Now this is an inductive argument, hopefully you can tell because it doesn't follow any of the deductively valid argument forms. Right? There are merely a, a series of statements that are just sort of loosely related to each other, right? There's no sort of pattern um, running through here. And so this is just a generalization, right, based on a, a series of individual claims. So it's inductive and it's not a very strong one, right, because these statements don't go together, right, in a way that makes the conclusion more likely than not. Okay. All right, so here's another practice. Okay, so again, take a look. Try to put it into formal structure and then assess what type of argument it is and how successful it is. So again, pause here if you'd like to practice before I go on to show you what you might have come up with for an answer. Okay, so here we have either we need to eat meat or we can eat other food items. We don't need to eat meat, so we can and should eat other food items, right? So this is deductively valid, right? Because we put it into a disjunctive syllogism type of form, and either or we removed one of them, okay? All right. Okay, so what happens when we come across arguments that we disagree with, right? So you might already be disagreeing with the examples that I've provided. I'm sure you'll disagree with, with the people that we're reading in, in our classes, right, and other sources. But what are our options, right? Because we don't want to 
um, be attacking people, right? We don't want to be responding simply based on emotion or using rhetoric. So what are the legitimate options available to us when there are arguments that we disagree with? Well, a simple way is showing, right, that the argument lacks the proper structure, right? That they've given us an inductively weak uh, argument or worse, a deduct I'm sorry, an inductively weak argument, or worse, a deductively invalid argument. So, right, even if their premises are true, they don't lead to their conclusion. The second argument is to say that, okay, yes, your argument is deductively valid or inductively strong, but one or more of your premises are false, right? You've actually just claimed something that isn't true, and so you've undermined the soundness or cogency of that argument. The third option is to do both, right? Um, and there's some other options that we're going to get into if you are writing a paper with me this quarter um, about looking at how one would justify the truth of certain premises. Perhaps their justification is uh, insufficient in some way. So we'll, we'll get to that later, but these are the two obvious ways of legitimately disagreeing with arguments that are given. Okay, so saying you don't like it is not going to be a sufficient response. <laughs> All right, there are some other ways in which we can go wrong or make errors in our reasoning, and these are called fallacies or fallacious reasoning. So there's a bunch in here. I encourage you to take a look at them. Uh, straw man or straw person is usually the most common fallacy that's used, right? So the idea is that instead of attacking a person's actual argument, you're like creating, I think, like a straw version of it, right? Something that's really weak and thus more easy to knock down. So the you know most well-known example of this are some of the uh, creationist attacks against theories of evolution, right? So instead of actually criticizing potential problems with the theory of evolution, of which there are some, um, if you know anything about issues in uh, philosophy of science, like falsifiability, the theory of evolution is not falsifiable, right? So that's a legitimate criticism with it. But the criticism we often hear is something that doesn't even make sense if you believe in evolution, right? So you'll hear people criticize evolution because, oh, well, evolution thinks we all came from monkeys, right? So it must be false. But evolution doesn't say that, right? What it actually says is that humans and great apes, right, certain marsupials, share a common ancestor, right? Not that we are, we descend from monkeys, right? So again, when we're criticizing something, we have to criticize the actual argument. We don't just get to create our own weaker version of it to attack more easily, okay? Other common ones are, again, to attack the person rather than attacking the argument. And it's not that personal criticisms are not useful, right? So if you're trying to assess the credibility or reliability or trustworthiness of a source, you definitely want to look at characteristics of that person. But even if the person is uncredible, unreliable, untrustworthy, right, that doesn't necessarily mean that everything that they say is wrong, right? So even you know, compulsive liars say true things every once in a while. So when we're attacking an argument, appealing to the person who made it is not in and of itself going to be a reason to accept or reject it. Now, often this is used to reject an argument, but we also want to make be careful we're not using an appeal to person to unwarrantedly accept an argument, right? So just because your parent told you something, right, and you trust them and they love you, that doesn't mean that everything that they say is right. Okay, so this is problematic in both ways. It's only useful when judging the source of an information, not when judging an actual argument. Okay, another fallacious way to criticize something or to appeal that something is true is to simply say that a lot of people believe it, right? Surely you know that a lot of people can be wrong, right? There are so many points in history for this, okay? So just because something is backed by a lot of people doesn't mean that it's backed by good reasons. Similarly here, just because an idea came from a certain place or group, right, otherwise known as the genetic fallacy, doesn't mean it's true or false, right? There are other instances of this, like appeal to tradition, right, just because we've done something many times doesn't mean that it's true. Okay. Another fallacy often used is equivocation, 
right? Where you act like you're arguing against something, but you're really using the same word in two different ways, right? And so um, uh, some examples of this can happen. I mean, I'll just use a simple one. If I say feathers are light, I like to be outside in the light, therefore I like to be outside in feathers. Well, I, I used two different meanings of the word light there. One of them was referring to sunlight and the other light was referring to weight, right? So that's a simple example. But people often equivocate terms, right? So someone might be using an argument about justice or race or equality or sex or gender, right? Very controversial issues. But one of the first things we have to do is understand what exactly they are meaning by that word, right? Because if we are assuming something different, then we're going to be speaking past each other and our criticisms are not going to be warranted. This is also a really problematic one, unfortunately used very often by uh, 45. And this is an appeal to ignorance, right? So saying that just because something hasn't been proven false, that it must be true, right? So. Here we sort of have to understand um, something like in uh, legal, legal terms is the burden of proof, right? So when we're trying to figure out who has the burden of proof, who the onus is on to make the case, it is typically the individual or party that is making what we might consider the more controversial claim, right? So controversial meaning less obviously true. So for example, if I was trying to argue about whether or not ghosts exist, right? Like my earlier example. Well, I can't just say, well, no one can prove that ghosts aren't real. That's not a good reason, right? So a lack of evidence is not evidence for the opposite, right? Or the same thing, just because it hasn't been proven true doesn't mean it's false, okay? So the individual making the more outrageous claim, right, the more unacceptable or controversial claim, they will have the burden of proof. And a lack of evidence, right, is not proof for the opposite. All right. The next one, again, unfortunately, also used a lot in politics is the false dilemma. So dilemma here, again, thinking of like a disjunctive giving us two options. This is considered false because basically in almost every context, right, there are going to be more than two options available to you. So I think the most common one is typically used in support of the military, right? So people will say either you're with us or against us, meaning that you either support the troops and thus support the wars that they're fighting in, or you're against the war and against the troops, right? And so this is a false dilemma because of course there are more than two options, right? You could be against the wars because you are for the troops, right? And you don't want them risking their lives unnecessarily, right? So just keep an eye out. Anytime someone gives you only two options, always check if there's another one, right? There almost always is, <laughs> unless we're talking about whether or not something exists, right? That's typically a yes or no, but right, even then there's some wiggle room. Okay, the next one is begging the question, right? Trying to prove a conclusion by using that very conclusion as support. So um, unfortunately, the most common example of this often comes in arguments for God's existence, right? So in order to prove that God exists, right, you couldn't then assume God's existence in your premises, right? So we can't say, well, God exists because the Bible says so, right? The Bible wouldn't count as legitimate support for the conclusion that God exists because the Bible already presupposes that God exists, right? So this is also sometimes called circular reasoning, right? Our reasoning just goes in a circle and has no legitimate foundation or starting point. All right, another one is slippery slope. So this has to do with cause and effect. Um, and just so you know, there are legitimate criticisms, right, that something will cause something else to happen. Uh, this occurs as a fallacy or a slippery slope when someone doesn't provide good reason or the connections between, and they just start erroneously or randomly connecting events, right? So if, you know, we legalize marijuana, then everyone's going to become a drug addict, right? No, <laughs> not only does, is that not endorsed by empirical evidence, right? 
but you have failed to demonstrate the connection, right? You have to actually show that this will lead to something else, lead to something else, and so on and so forth. All right, there's some other uh, fallacies here of composition and division. Um, I'm not going to get too far into those, right? But the idea simply is that just because something is true of the parts doesn't mean it's true of the whole and vice versa. So a simple example is that just because our bodies are made out of atoms, which are invisible to the naked eye, doesn't mean that our bodies are invisible to the naked eye, right? Same thing with division. Just because something is true of the whole doesn't mean it's true of the parts, right? So if you think of like a sweater that is blue, but if you were to look at each of the individual strings, perhaps some of the individual pieces of yarn are different colors, right? Doesn't mean that the, the sweater's not blue, right? So again, just because something is true of the parts or the whole doesn't mean it's true of the other. Okay, and then there are a lot of other ad hominems, right? Personal attacks, which go along with the um, appeal to persons we were talking about before. Regardless of what your issue with the person is, that doesn't have any bearing on whether or not the argument is valid, right? Or the reasons they're giving are true, okay? Again, it's only a legitimate criticism of them as a credible source. So this often comes up, again, in politics, where we think that maybe someone just said something because they happen to be part of a certain party, right? Or, you know, if you see a person of color and they're talking about racism or a woman who's talking about feminism, right? You're like, oh, well, they're just saying that because they're a part of this group. That is a personal attack, right? So again, it doesn't matter who they are, right? Or anything about their person in regards to whether or not what they're saying is true. We need to be assessing those on different standards. All right, so here's a review of the fallacies went over. There are a lot of other ones, so make sure to look online or through our books if you, if you wanna uh, check those out. All right, so again, you can take a break here if you'd like. I'm gonna now go on to help you practice building your own arguments just really quickly, but um, you will probably wanna take some time to go through this on your own. All right, so let's start with modus ponens. So if we remember, right, this is if P then Q. We know it's affirming the antecedent, so our second premise is P, therefore Q. Now, ironically, when we're building our own arguments, we're actually gonna start off at the bottom. We're gonna start off with the conclusion. So we're gonna figure out what we wanna argue for, we're gonna plug that in to the premise where it belongs, and then fill in the rest. So I'll show you what that looks like. So again, here's our argument form for modus ponens. So again, I wanna start off with my conclusion. And just for the sake of uh, consistency, I'm going to use a common uh, argument in philosophy of religion that has to do with the problem of evil, just to show you how this looks differently for modus ponens and modus tollens. And then I'll let you do the other ones on your own. So starting off with this idea, right? The basic idea is that if God exists, then that God is all good, all powerful, and all knowing. If God is all good, God wouldn't want evil to exist. If God is all powerful, God could prevent evil from occurring when and where they wanted to. And if God is all knowing, then God would know when and where evil would occur, and so would be able to stop it, right? So the basic idea is then, if this type of God exists, evil should not exist. So if evil does exist, then that type of God does not, right? So that's just a brief overview of the argument from evil. So here's how we could put it into modus ponens form. We would start off with the conclusion, right? That God does not exist. In our modus ponens, we know that this is going to represent Q. Okay, so where else does Q occur in our premises? Well, it's in the consequent of premise one. So we can plug it in. If P, then God does not exist. So now I just need to fill in something for P that makes sense, right? So I'm not gonna say, if the sky is green, then God does not, right? That has no bearing on <laughs> the existence of God. So we're gonna put in something here that makes sense. And again, utilizing the argument, the problem of evil, we're gonna simply say, if evil exists, then God does not exist. Okay, so now we have our conditional for premise one. We already know what our conclusion is, so we just have to assert P on line two, Evil does exist, therefore God does not exist. All right, now we're gonna do the same thing with modus tollens. And even though the conclusion is the same, we wanna note how the premises are gonna to look totally different, okay? So 
here again, modus tollens. Modus tells us we're dealing with a conditional statement. This means denying the consequent. So on line two, we're going to say not Q, therefore not P. All right, so let's practice. Okay, here using the same exact conclusion, God does not exist. Notice though that here our conclusion is not Q anymore. It's not even P, it's not P. So we have to figure out where else P occurs. Well, P occurs on premise one. But remember, our conclusion is not P, so P is going to be the opposite. So if not P is God does not exist, then P is God does exist. So premise one is going to be if God does exist, then something, right? So again, here we have to figure out something to plug in that makes sense. Again, using the argument of evil just as an example. If God does exist, well then evil would not exist, right? Then there would be no evil. But, right, now our premise two is to deny the consequent. There is evil. Therefore, God does not exist. Okay, so a little bit of help there. I would like you to go through on your own and practice constructing your own arguments using modus ponens, modus tollens. Again, you start with the conclusion and work your way up. And then do the same thing for disjunctive syllogism, right? Either or, not one, therefore the other. And again, you can do it the other way as well. Hypothetical syllogism. If P, then Q. If Q, then R. Therefore, if P, then R. So you can see I've even color-coded the variables. So just make sure whatever you plug in for that variable in one place, you plug the exact same thing in for the other. Okay. Constructive dilemma is another argument form. This is basically a combination of disjunctive and two conditional statements, right? So either P or Q. If P, then R. If Q, then S. Therefore, either R or S. So since I didn't go over this one earlier, I'll just give you an example. Either it's going to rain today or it's going to be sunny. If it rains, then I will go to the movies. If it's sunny, then I will go to the beach. Therefore, either I will go to the movies or I will go to the beach. All right, so again, but when you make your own, try to start off with the conclusion first, figuring out what you want to argue for, and then working backwards.